Hello everyone. Today uh, we review chapter three of the textbook. This chapter is dealing with managing project teams. Managing project teams is uh, probably one of the most critical responsibilities of the project manager. And that's uh, what we are going to be talking about in terms of how we work with the project team and how we motivate them and how we develop the project teams. To do this, uh, we are going to be looking at um, some of the characteristics of project team and the factors that influence their, uh, their performance. We uh, also uh, explain some of the theories about motivating project teams and some of the guidelines uh, along those lines. We also uh, talk about uh, the sources, the effects of leadership, about power in the teams. We also talk about conflicts in uh, project teams. And lastly, we will talk about global projects. Global projects are, have become more and more common and frankly, many of the challenges that uh, are involved with uh, global projects, we see them even with uh, some of the domestic projects. So we'll talk about that as well. The uh, case that was shared in the textbook is about a uh, Canadian company that used a uh, team-based project structure and project approach to de deliver the Dexter robotic arm for the International Space Station. Uh, they delivered this on time, despite the fact that they had to make uh, deal with many changes during this project. To achieve this, a number of things that uh, uh, they did, uh, they co-located the team, they provided a, an open office environment that promoted collaboration and communications. And they also gave the team a lot of autonomy because this was a, a, a team of, of experts in many fields. So uh, in the work environment, you often uh, see work groups that are put in place to work on a particular issue. For example, when I was the chief technology officer, one of the work groups that uh, we formed consisted of the clerks of the courts. And uh, these individuals who were the leaders or chief operating officers of the courts, they were pulled together from different parts of the country to come up with some of the best practices to uh, manage the office of the clerk of the court. So uh, that's a work group set up. Typically the work group, uh, people who are involved with the work group, they spend a small portion of their time. They're not fully uh, assigned to, to the work group. And um, so it's, it's a lot more difficult to bring about a um, team environment, even though uh, in, in my case uh, for the work groups, I tried very hard to highlight the, the common objectives and, and really bring some of the, the team aspects uh, to the work group in terms of sharing the common vision and common um, goal that with these best practices, basically all clerks would be performing better. So they had some uh, personal interest in the outcome of the activities. But um, the, uh, in the project team, of course, uh, the uh, individuals typically spend majority of their time uh, involved with the project and uh, there needs to be some uh, effort put in to uh, build the team, build the trust within the team, um, and um, making sure that the information is flowing freely uh, within the team. And, and also uh, the team is empowered 
by uh, giving them some autonomy in making uh, some of the decisions that need to be made. Project teams go through a number of uh, phases and uh, Tuckman has uh, come up with uh, the following phases the, uh, for, uh, that the project goes through. The initial phase is the forming uh, phase and this is the time that basically the team is put together and they are getting to know each other and, and they're just establishing the, the overall goals, they're establishing the, the assignments uh, uh, for individual members. Then they move into the storming phase. This is where uh, the, the uh, team is finalizing uh, the, the goals of the team and the, um, they are, uh, uh, there is a, a, some power struggle at this stage to establish power within the team and uh, also establishing the, the leadership role. After that, there is uh, and now the team starts uh, to develop some sense of uh, common objectives, common purpose, uh, and they start uh, operating in a normal way. And um, as they get more comfortable together uh, with each other and uh, uh, and work better as a team, the team uh, actually performs uh, uh, well and uh, uh, and delivers the deliverable that uh, they're assigned to do. And of course, at the end, there is an adjourning uh, phase where the, the team gets wrapped up and uh, the, the final deliverables are put in place. There are several factors that impact team's performance. Uh, as we, uh, as we develop the teams, we have to be aware of these factors. For example, if uh, we have a team that is less experienced, they need more direction. Uh, conversely, if they are an experienced uh, team, they can give, be given more uh, autonomy. Uh, the more the team has worked together in the past, um, it's very likely that they have more trust. Of course, in some cases, maybe they have worked in the past and they don't have the trust and they don't trust each other. And that's actually a challenging situation because now you have to come up with ways to establish trust uh, among people who had not uh, who had not uh, have a very good working relationship uh, with each other in the past. One of the uh, things that uh, impact the uh, team's performance is communication. And communication is, uh, it gets uh, rapidly very complicated as uh, the number of um, uh, team members grow. And in fact, uh, you see the, the uh, formula for uh, calculating the number of communication interfaces is n times n minus one uh, divided by two. So if you have two people, that becomes two times two minus one, which is one divided by two is one. When there are two people, there is one interface between them. Uh, if you increase the number of people in the team to three, then you have three interfaces. If you go to 10, if you go to five members, then the number of interfaces increase to 10. And uh, if you go to 10, uh, uh, a team of uh, with 10 members, then you have 45 uh, communication interfaces. What this uh, suggests is that uh, a couple of points. One is that you actually want to keep the teams relatively small because of this communication challenge. And if if there is a need for larger uh, larger number of people to be involved, come up with some sub teams so that again the communication within each team is optimized.
There have been many studies that have shown diverse teams are more creative and more innovative. And uh, the diversity can uh, is not only related to race, gender, or educational background, but it could be the type of work they do and the, uh, the what they are excellent in. Some people may be really good in, in fixing things. Uh, others may be good in finishing things. So the point here is that you have to recognize that on a, a project team, you have different skill sets, different attributes, and that uh, diversity of capabilities actually a strength in, in a team. So how do we motivate a project team? Um, there are a number of motivational theories. We are going to look at some of those. And uh, also there are some guidelines in how to motivate project teams. And we'll take a look at those as well. So let's first uh, talk about motivation. What do we mean when we, are, uh, we say uh, we want to motivate a team? By, uh, by motivating a team, we mean that there is intensity. Their members are willing to work hard. There is direction. They, uh, they channel their intensity and their work uh, toward the project goals. Uh, there is also persistence. Uh, they persevere and they keep their intensity throughout the project. This is what uh, uh, Robbins and, and Judge in 2017 have come up with as a model for motivation. Over the last uh, 50 years or so, there are many motivational uh, theories that have uh, explained how different personal factors can shape a person's motivation. Uh, one of the most recognized theories is Maslow's hier hierarchy of uh, needs. Uh, what it basically is, is um, uh, saying that people have very basic needs like physiological needs. Uh, if they're hungry, they're thirsty, they're, uh, they don't have a shelter, they can't focus on any, anything else. Those are the most critical needs and all their focus will be there until those needs are satisfied. Similarly, uh, if uh, they need to be secure and they need to be protected to be able to, to think about anything else, if they are not safe, that is going to be their, their focus. After they have those physiological and safety uh, factors or needs satisfied, then there is a, a need for social, the affections, the ac acceptance, the friendship with other people. And then they, uh, if they have that in place, then uh, they can be thinking about self-respect, the autonomy, achieving uh, status and the goals that they have for themselves. And they, they, if they have all of that, then they can, uh, they, they can reach a, a self-actualization and uh, growth on, and fulfillment. There is a similar uh, a theory called ERG, and it, it roughly uh, maps to Maslow's hierarchy of needs. As you can see, the existence uh, maps to safety and physiological needs. Uh, relatedness maps into social uh, and the growth uh, uh, relates to self-actualization and esteem uh, f levels of Maslow's uh, model. Traditionally, when we uh, think about, uh, okay, we want to motivate people and we want to keep them satisfied, uh, traditionally the view has been that there is a, there is a spectrum as one end is the, uh, people are dissatisfied and, and the other end people are satisfied. Herzberg and others argued that there are certain hygiene factors, as they call it, that need to be in place so employees are not dissatisfied. 
meaning that if these uh, factors such as uh, the right level of salary, right, right level of security, uh, the status, if they don't have some minimum level of those, uh, then they are not going to be satisfied. And uh, for, for and then after you you achieve that level of um, uh, of hygiene factors, meaning if when you address all those, then you can focus on some motivational uh, factors such as opportunities for achievement, recognition, advancement. So uh, it it's somewhat of a different view that uh, if you have not satisfied those hygiene factors, really you cannot address motivational factors. There's some uh, parallel, I'm, I'm sure you see between this and Maslow's uh, pyramid of, of needs. McClellan's uh, theory has been found to best explain uh, work productivity. It uh, proposes that individuals' motivation can be explained by their need for achievement, power, and affiliation. Achievement means uh, the drive to go beyond a set of standards. Power is uh, having the control of the behavior of others. Affiliation is the desire for a closeness and, and a friendliness uh, uh, and affiliation with uh, or relationships that you have you establish. Interesting enough, research has shown that good managers have a high need for power, uh, but they have low need for affiliation. Another set of motivational th theories are called process theories. Uh, process theories of motivation focus uh, on proper work environment, work processes, and uh, rewards. And there are a multitude of uh, theories. Theory X, for example, says that people dislike work and they are lazy. So they need to be coerced, they need to be um, uh, scared uh, of the consequences to work hard. Uh, this is rather an older way of looking at motivational theory. Theory Y, uh, on the other hand, says people like work and are creative, but they like autonomy. So there are many uh, different theories, as you can see. Uh, the one that is mostly uh, used and accepted is expectancy theory. In expectancy theory, uh, basically the, 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 the idea is that, uh, by the way, this is the basis for many of the performance evaluation systems and organization. It basically links person's effort to their performance and of course their performance to the organizational recognition and rewards and having gotten those rewards and recognitions then it would help the individual to meet their personal goals. One of the points, uh, so this is the theory, uh, but one of the points that I'd, I'd like to make is that we have to be careful about uh, money as a manager we have to be careful about monitoring uh, uh, individual efforts uh, we are better off to really work on individual performance what I mean by that is that in many old-time management style for example thinks about um, people have to be at work for eight hours uh, you know between um, eight and, and five but uh, the reality is that uh, more and more managers are recognizing that it doesn't really matter if you can do the work at some other time, 
um, why would the, the organization care? So that's where the more flexible work schedule has come about and people are given more freedom in terms of managing their individual efforts themselves and the managers would focus more on what do they produce so they focus on the individual performance and they don't become micromanagers in terms of telling the the, um, the employees that you have to to get the work done in this way and that way there is no need for that they let the employee do the work as best or in the most convenient way as they can do and uh, reap the, the and and focus on the the results of their performance so there are some guidelines for motivating team members uh, uh, recognizing individual differences we already talked about this that we have to to realize that each team needs different skills different uh, skill sets and uh, using specific goals establishing a goal and uh, providing feedback to uh, the team members as uh, they achieve the, the goals that you have laid out for them and um, this is also very important to include people in the decisions that the uh, it would affect them now it is it should be clearly communicated and understood within the team uh, environment that ultimately the team manager the project manager has to make the decision but getting the input from uh, from the team members and adjusting the decision based on uh, that feedback uh, it's very critical in building a team making sure that the uh, rewards are linked to performance meaning that uh, when a team member is awarded or receive an award or recognition it is clearly tied to the performance so uh, there is a, a clear equity in the system in, ter in terms of how performance is rewarded a project manager has a dual rule uh, role uh, a project manager is a manager and in that role he focuses on objectives telling how and when things uh, need to be done uh, sets up the organization the structure uh, make sure that the administrative tasks are taken care of the reporting and and the like but as a leader that's the other role for the project manager as a leader the project manager has to establish a common vision why are we doing this project selling the project what is it and why are we doing this uh, focus on on people focus on on innovation and coming up with new ways of doing things a lot of project managers are good in managing but not good in leading and motivating uh, the other team so that's an area to become a good project manager you really need to focus on to uh, be uh, uh, one of some of the best project managers around there are several leadership theories that uh, uh, explain the leadership the trait theories essentially attribute the, uh, uh, the leader's uh, abilities on their personality, <clears throat> on their confidence, on their competency. Behavior uh, theories, on the other hand, they uh, focus more on what the, uh, the leader does, the actions, the behaviors you know are they authoritarian or are they inclusive <clears throat> contingency theories uh, emphasize the fact that different leadership style is needed for different uh, different situations so you have to really look at the situation and decide what is the 
the proper leadership style for that situation. And good leaders <clears throat> have many different leadership styles that they can uh, switch to depending on the situation. As we just saw, contingency theories of leadership considers the situation to be the most critical factor in selecting the right leadership style. This chart uh, looks at a number of uh, factors that impact the situation. Uh, looks at the leadership member relations, the task structure, and the, the leader power. <clears throat> And then it compares two leadership styles that are very distinct. One is task oriented, focusing on getting the tasks done versus the other uh, leadership style that focuses more on building relationship with people and, and getting the work done through those relationships. And it shows that, for example, if we take the, <clears throat> the situation on the far left and the middle, the far left, uh, this is the situation where the, uh, the leader member relation is good. The task is highly structured and le the leader's power is strong. In this situation, actually a task oriented leadership uh, results in better performance. But on the other hand, if we take the situation <clears throat> that the leader member relationship is poor. The task still is highly structured and the leader's power is still strong. Then in that situation, a relationship oriented leadership is better uh, because it will address the poor relationship th uh, that exists between the leader and the member more effectively. <clears throat> Another model uh, in situational leadership focus, uh, focuses on, on characteristics of uh, followers to determine the best leadership style. And uh, let's again, let's look at the two extremes, uh, the top uh, right is where you have uh, the followers who are very competent and they're highly committed to uh, the project. In this uh, case, the, leader, uh, the, the leadership attributes should be delegating, uh, low directive, and, uh, and uh, you don't really need a whole lot of supportive because uh, supportive behavior because uh, the followers, the team members, are uh, committed and, and competent. Taking that uh, or compare that situation with the lower left situation, uh, this is uh, where the followers are uh, maybe have low level of competency. They are, are not un, uh, they are not able to carry out all the tasks that they sh should be able to get done. And then uh, they may be also unwilling uh, uh, to, uh, uh, to put the effort in. And in this case, the uh, leader has more of a selling and coaching uh, role uh, to get the, uh, the team members motivated, but also uh, requires a high directive and so a high uh, supportive behavior to help people to, uh, with their tasks that they are not familiar how to do. <clears throat> Closely related to leadership is power. Power is the ability of a person to Im influence the behavior or attitudes of one or more people. Power is related to politics, within a team and understanding it enables you to better work uh, with the politics involved. The uh, positional power uh, are powers that 
that you have because of, of your position. Uh, maybe you're a supervisor, you uh, have the ability to uh, reward individuals. Uh, maybe you have coercive power that you have the uh, ability to punish people or maybe fire them. <clears throat> Uh, or your power could be personal power. Uh, you may have some expertise that are unique and other people need to ask you and get your help. Uh, you may be a very charismatic uh, person and you uh, charm people and that's, that would be an example of a personal power. Whenever you have a team, a group of people, conflict is unavoidable. Now, some level of uh, conflict is functional and it actually helps support the goals of the team and improves the performance of the team. <clears throat> but there are some uh, conflicts that uh, make the team dysfunctional and uh, it prevents them from uh, doing the work that they are uh, they're given uh, to do. So let's uh, look at look at some of the uh, conflict and uh, uh, the interaction between conflict and and team performance. Uh, this chart shows that there is an optimal level of conflict that would actually improve team's performance. This, uh, <clears throat> this is when there is a healthy disagreement and debate that occurs with the intention to find the best solution. On the other hand, if there are no conflicts, meaning that there is no debate about any decisions, or on the other hand, on the other end of the spectrum, there is a high level of conflict if everything is debated, if everything is, is argued. In either of those cases, the team performance is not going to be optimal. This is another look at the range of conflicts. If there are no discussion or, uh, or questioning, there's probably misunderstanding. Uh, some questioning, some challenging is healthy. But as conflicts move to verbal attacks, threats, ultimatums, then the team becomes dysfunctional. On the extreme, the conflict can get to the level of physical attacks where it actually becomes dangerous and it becomes an unsafe work environment. Hopefully, you, we, none of us have to uh, deal with that situation because that, that is not a, a um, good working environment. <clears throat> One way to reduce conflict is to clarify roles and responsibilities within a, a team. RACI is a, a good tool for this and, and uh, I have uh, use this uh, for many years uh, and it, it really helps to clarify uh, who is <clears throat> responsible for each task. RACI basically lays out for each task who's responsible for doing the work related to that particular task. Who is ultimately accountable to make sure that the task is done uh, properly and, and the deliverable or put in, uh, in as they were promised, who's ultimately responsible for that task. That's accountable, that's the A. Who's consulted uh, with for this task? Who should be consulted for this task? Maybe there are people who are experts and, and as we carry out this task, they need to be consulted. Those would be C's. And then lastly, who needs to be kept up to date and, and kept informed of uh, the progress on this task. And uh, those individuals will have I. So that's the RACI, R-A-C-I um, 
tool and it's it's uh, as i mentioned it is a very effective simple but very effective tool to bring about discussion among the team members of how they will uh, divide their responsibilities for various tasks managing global teams is has become more and more common in recent years and uh, and they present a set of challenges when i worked on the project in the republic of kazakhstan we had people from the us of course but also from kazakhstan from england and australia uh, uh, on our our project team we also were working with kazakhs and and turkish and hungarian contractors so aside from the language barriers, barriers, there are many different cultural norms that we had to become familiar with. Uh, this chart shows some of the reasons of why we have had such an increase in international projects in, in recent years. Um, it, the uh, the advancement of telecommunication the fact that we can have video conferences and discussion boards uh, that has helped uh, our, our ability to carry out work globally uh, the whole globalization uh, movement over the last 20 30 years uh, uh, has also created more opportunities for global uh, teams and of course, uh, because of the difference in, in labor costs, many of the, uh, the tasks are done, uh, are outsourced because, uh, uh, because of the, the cost advantage. So all of these have contributed to growth in uh, global uh, projects, information technology projects. There are a number of unique challenges with uh, managing global projects. Uh, lack of expertise, and uh, you may not find the expertise in, in the uh, part of the world that you are carrying out uh, the project. Uh, there may be cultural differences. Uh, we found that there are uh, very strict uh, rules in terms of who sits at the table uh, when we were gathering with the local officials and the, uh, the placement of the various people uh, was tied to their rank in the organization. There are environmental challenges in the same project, the Tengiz project in Republic of Kazakhstan. When we uh, uh, started working with that oil field, there were many practices that uh, were not acceptable for Chevron. <clears throat> and uh, they, we had to uh, establish different norms to prevent oil spills and, and other environmental impacts. Of course, in many uh, places, uh, uh, the internet connection and, and uh, telecommunication and techno technology can be a challenge. Uh, interesting enough, when you look at these challenges, uh, uh, frankly, I have seen some of these challenges also with domestic projects. When we are doing domestic projects, we have people from different cultures. We have uh, in different parts of the country. We have different uh, uh, internet uh, capabilities and, and so forth. So uh, these are not just unique to global uh, projects, but of course, global projects kind of magnify uh, these issues even more. This table compares uh, various cultural dimensions in various countries. Uh, for example, uh, in the US, uh, which is the group one on this uh, the column uh, titled with group one, uh, there is a high level of indi individualism and a short-term focus. That's some of the attributes of, of our culture here. On the other hand, if we compare that with the last column uh, in China, uh, 
there is uh, actually a high level of collectivism and, and there is a long term focus. So there are uh, clear differences in cultures and whenever we are working with a culture, we really need to uh, understand these differences so that we can address those and we can deal with those uh, more effectively. Uh, otherwise, any of these uh, differences could be the source of conflict within the team. There are a number of strategies for managing global projects. Clearly, hiring people with experience in uh, working across different cultures when people have had that experience, uh, that's going to be <clears throat> very helpful. Uh, preferably uh, those individuals who can speak multiple languages and can communicate with various uh, team members. Again, that's a big plus. At uh, Chevron, all of the uh, Tengiz projects uh, team members were sent to Moscow for a one week intense Russian language training. Uh, also, the uh, team members were uh, oriented and trained about Cossacks' culture and the political issues at the time. And all of that turned out to be extremely helpful for us to be able to have some minimal level of uh, communication in their own uh, language and also be sensitive about some of the uh, uh, cultural or political issues that we needed to be aware of. So this uh, concludes my lecture on chapter three. Uh, thank you very much for your uh, attention.